Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Shout it out. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. Great is the Lord, and he is greatly to be praised. Praise God. I just want to welcome everyone to Harvest Christian Center Midweek Service, where we continue in our study on biblical worldview. Do we have any first timers on Wednesday night? First time here on Wednesday night. I just give our first time a hand. I want a, a couple reminders. I want to thank everyone for their uh, love and support for the youth uh, as they had the fundraise on Sunday for the burger sale. I think we've raised over $625. <laughs> uh, those funds will be going toward the settlement trip the conference that they used to go to Gatlinburg, Tennessee every year uh, and worship the Lord. Also, if you didn't have an uh, opportunity to donate, you can also, you can uh, donate in any of the offerings, just market youth, you know, to go to the youth and get the, uh, the youth there at itself. Also, this weekend is our Alpha Women's Retreat. All right, I uh, hope y'all are ready for the Alpha Women's Retreat. Uh, if you did pick up your packet on Sunday, it is a packet in the lobby that all the information you need to know about the Women's Retreat this weekend Amen. We're, we're praying that they come back fired up amen. And, and, this, and continue to set this house on fire for the Lord. Also on Tuesday, next Tuesday, the food bank will be needing help unloading, sorting, and boxing, boxing up food uh, to distribute on that next uh, Thursday. If you're interested, just come out at, I think it is uh, 10, 15 a.m., stop by the office and uh, lend a hand and help out. And you can actually come back on Thursday morning to distribute the food. And also someone uh, asked about when our next, when we have our next baptism. Next baptism will not be this Sunday, but the following Sunday. If you rededicated your life to the Lord or you got baptized at an early age and you just can't remember and it, or it didn't really mean anything, you can get rebaptized. Just put a note in the offering. <laughs> I'm looking at who mentioned it to me. I had told I had a special announcement before. So put a note in the offering basket. Let them know you desire to be baptized. We'll make sure you get baptized. And I, I thank God that this evening we're not evacuating. But there's so many that are evacuating tonight. Trying to get ahead of the storm. Actually, I think three of my daughters are evacuating from Orlando and Jacksonville. But we want to be in prayer for for, uh, for Haiti that just suffered a drought. Now they just went through the hurricane in Cuba. And uh, we want to pray that, you know, all those waterborne diseases, God keeps it for them and God provides provisions for them. And then as they go towards the Bahamas, and, um, we're praying, uh, let's continue to pray that it goes back out to sea. Uh, I understand today that all the ships over in Mayport uh, Jacksonville area is out to sea. The families had to evacuate military housing. And that's usually in Ohio. So when the hurricane comes, the men and women get on the ships, and the families have to find some way to go. So our prayers will be with them. Other than that, boys, I've been watching the news all day, trying to. Tell my daughters what to do, fill up on gas tonight, and my understanding the pumps are running out of fuel now. I was looking at that all all morning long, and on top of that, the transgender policy came out of the military. And it just, ah, oh, oh, help us, help us. And, uh, and I've been in prayer all night for that, all day for that. Let's continue to pray for our nation. Pray, pray uh, that the people of God arise up and, and, and stand up for God's word. Amen. I said, enough is enough. Amen. We're going to stand up for God's word, whatever it takes. Well, let's go ahead and uh, uh, get ready to receive the tithing offering for the night. Our offering scripture. 
offer scriptures was 1 John. Some people used to call it I John. 1 <laughs> John, 3rd chapter, 17th and 18th verse. And it says, But whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shut up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let, a, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And let us pray. Father, we just, we thank you for, for who you are, God. But you saw it. A lot of times we think that things are gotten out of control. But thank God we know the one that is in control. The one that we can depend on. The one that we can talk to, get direction from. And Lord, we thank you tonight. Lord, we thank you for this Bible study. I believe it's on time Bible study. To focus our minds on the things we have to do as we go forward in this time. And Lord, we ask you to anoint and bless it. Speak through the leaders here. And speak through each and every one of us as we discuss your word. And Lord, now we ask you to send provisions for those that suffered loss from the hurricane. Lord, as they re rebuild, let they rebuild and it better be better than what it first was. Those who will go over and minister, Lord, let it be a growing time that even more Christians will be raised up in that area. Lord, we just thank you for the, the time and the offering that's given on tonight. Lord, we ask you to bless it. Let it be used for your glory, your kin, kingdom building, and helping your people. And Lord, we ask you to bless those that gave, those that desired to give and didn't have. Those that's looking for a job. Lord, I ask you to give a special supernatural favor. They may honor you the provision you allow them to have. Lord, we thank you for what you do, what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen.
share the word of the Lord tonight, to use our voices. This uh, next song, I was just thinking about it. Uh, it was the last song that on this earth I heard my daughter's voice. She had called us, and I just thought about that when we were getting ready to sing it. And she had, she and her son were singing. He was four years old, and, and she was singing, We Fall Down and Lay Our Crowns at the Feet of Jesus. I don't say that to make you sad tonight at all, but it's a wonderful thing that she was able to, just a few days after she sang that, really fall down before his throne to save her. I don't know what it was like, but I believe it's a great homecoming in heaven for her. And what a privilege we have to do that tonight. We fall down even ahead of time.
see you all in the house of the Lord. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, I want to give just a quick report. Last week we were praying over uh, Pastor Derek uh, beginning a program over at Ransom Middle School. And he had his first session today of priority, first priority. And uh, we we're grateful they had 11 students there and five that came in toward the end. So the seed of the first day, and they haven't even announced it at school yet. He said he, he spoke to one of the teachers that does the announcements in the morning. They're going to start announcing it uh, and, and get it out to all the students. But they had five more, so they had 16 on their first gathering day. And we did their first days. that are going on the women's retreat are excited. They're leaving in less than 48 hours. In fact, 48 hours from now, they'll be in their first service in, in Birmingham. And great anticipation of all that's going to be going on. I talked to Bishop Gray today, and Miss Karen is already at the venue. She gets there. She likes to get there early and make sure everything's going to go well. So she's already there at the venue getting everything together and in preparation for those. And we that, that shall remain that are not going to be caught up in the cars and going to Birmingham, we that remain will have great anticipation on their return, bringing the fire that God, as Pastor John said, the fire that God places inside of them, bringing it back here and, and uh, continuing to fan the flames that God is stirring amongst us here at Harvest. So uh, we're grateful for all the things that are going on. Thank you, man. $600 on a hamburger uh, fundraiser. And I know some of you ate hamburgers and some of you just gave money. And uh, God bless you for that. Uh, we're looking forward again to Accelerant in January. This is the big, big youth trip where the focus is, is primarily on worship and Bible study. And so we look forward to that um, coming up in January. All right. So tonight we are going to continue for at least one more week our look at biblical worldview. I asked for a show of hands last week. Uh, how many of you wanted us to continue? And I'm going to start with the Bible and science tonight and many of you raised your hands and and I, I guess I spoke something over the ones that didn't I said it must be because you're not gonna be here Wednesday and sure enough <laughs> <laughs> they must have took that like pastor given permission or something but we're glad that you're here and uh, we're gonna we're gonna jump into our study tonight as we continue uh, what I believe has been a timely a timely uh, walk through taking a look at issues through a biblical worldview lens. So on one of, on one of your sheets, somebody wrote about how uh, science and gods oftentimes appear to us or are presented to us as contradictory, that they can't uh, be in alignment with each other. And so we're going to look at science through a biblical lens, a biblical worldview tonight. And uh, first, I want to give some definitions of science before I read the first scripture. Now I want you to listen carefully to these definitions of science. Now be before I share the first definition, let me just ask you this. Somebody give me, a couple of you somebodies, give me a take on what you think science, when you hear that's scientific fact, what do you think of? Definitive. It's definitive. Alright? Somebody else? I mean it's science. So if it's science it's got to be proven. It's got to be facts. It's got to be true. Okay. So that is a framework. I want to read you a couple of definitions of science. Science uses specialized terms that have different meanings than everyday usage. These definitions correspond to the way scientists typically use these terms in the context of their work. So they're only used by them, for them, about them, to prove them. Note especially that the meaning of theory in science is different than the meaning of theory in everyday conversation. So here we go. We're going to talk about this. Fact. In science, an observation that has been repeatedly confirmed and for all practical purposes is accepted as true. That's what a fact is. Truth in science, however, is never final. And what is accepted as fact today may be modified or even discarded tomorrow. So there's your definition of fact in terms of dealing with science. Now I'm not here to discredit science tonight. Science is vital to us. 
Many of us are thankful for the science of medicine and other things that helps us. But I want us to begin to understand and look at science with a biblical worldview. So the next word I'm going to define is hypothesis. A hypothesis because these are the terms they use in establishing scientific theory and fact. Hypothesis is a tentative, a tentative statement about the natural world leading to deductions that can be tested or proven. If the deductions are verified, the hypothesis is provisionally corroborated. If the deductions are incorrect, the original hypothesis is proved false and must be abandoned or modified. And hypothesis can be used to build more complex inferences and explanations. How many of you already are going, what is that he said? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. A law in science, a law, a descriptive generalization about how some aspect of the natural world behaves under stated circumstances. Let me read that again. A law is a descriptive generalization about how, now when we hear the word generalization, in fact, we think those two things can't hardly go together, can they? All right. Of some aspect of the no, no, I'm sorry, of some aspect of the natural world behaves under stated circumstances, and then there's the theory. The theory in science is a well substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world that can incorporate facts, laws, inferences, and tested hypotheses. A scientific fact is defined as any observation that has been repeatedly confirmed and accepted as true by the scientific community. But it can change at any time. Any scientific, and another definition of scientific fact is any scientific observation that has not been refuted. So if no one comes to talk against it, it's just accepted as fact. These are not my definitions. These are definitions I pulled off of the interweb. And so if we got them off the interweb, you know they got to be factual. They got to be scientific fact. These are from Miriam's Dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, uh, the American Heritage Dictionary. So now I want to read this as if, uh, I hope I haven't confused you too much, but I want to read this about theory basics. The University of California, Berkeley, defines a theory as a broad natural explanation for a wide range of phenomena. Theories are concise, coherent, systematic, predictive, and broadly applicable, often integrating and generalizing many hypotheses. Any scientific theory must be based on a careful and rational examination of the facts. Facts and theories are two different things. In the scientific method, there is a clear distinction between facts, which can be observed and or measured, and theories, which are scientists' explanations and interpretation of the facts. An important part of scientific theory includes statements that have observational consequences. A good theory, like Newton's theory of gravity, has unity, which means it consists of a limited number of problem-solving strategies that can be applied to a wide range of scientific circumstances. And another feature of a good theory is that it's formed from a number of hypotheses that can be tested independently and corroborated by the scientific community. So in other words, Whatever they observe, whatever they test, as long as they corroborate it together and it gets a generalized corroboration, it becomes a science or a scientific fact. So, I just wanted to share that. And, and, and honey, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're trying to remember something we read a couple of weeks ago about how they described science and that it's, it's, that it's uh, agreed upon by... It's a consensus. There's four steps, and one of the steps is a consensus of the scientists that are doing the Yeah. So to establish a new science or scientific fact, all is required is a consensus of the scientists that are viewing those things. So it doesn't have to be necessarily proven. There just needs to be, I mean, it should be, but there just needs to be a consensus of the scientists. Now, again, I'm not up here to discredit science. But the world has put all of their eggs in that basket. 
in the scientific community. And quite literally, if we break this down into layman's language, for me, it simply says, if a group of guys with a lot of letters behind their name get together and decide something can be corroborated among them together that they can look at and test a little bit and then decide that it becomes a scientific fact, it's a scientific fact. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so if that's the case, then Christianity could be a science. Because all of us in here together pretty much have corroborated what we believe to be true and have tested it by our acts of faith. And so another part of that definition was they take a leap, right? Wasn't that in the definition? In one of the definitions, they have to take a leap of faith <laughs> to corroborate what they're looking at. So now... We in this room, and I without a single set of initials behind my name, have created the science of Christianity. That's kind of the way things can play out in the scientific community. Now, I don't think there's any kind of conspiracy or anything there. What I'm simply saying is, I find it would take more faith for me to believe everything science tells me than it takes for me to believe what I read in Scripture. Amen. Anybody comments or questions there? And if you're a scientist in here, I love you. And please understand, science is important. We're not here to discredit or throw out science, but we're here to look at it that it is not the final say. There is only one who has the final say. And his name is God. Yes, sir. history through archaeology, you know, with the digs that they found. And then there's the history that Egypt has put forth when they think the time frame happened. And then there's the Bible, which is the constant. And what this show uh, shows is that uh, the Egyptian timeline is skewed because the Bible doesn't line up with the archaeology and the way Egypt times it. But at the end of this show, it proves that the archaeologists and the Egyptians that made the timeline were skewed. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating program. It is a fascinating program, and I think everybody should, should watch it because if you look at the evidence and you, you apply it, everything lines up in the Bible. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. What's it called? Uh, patterns, of patterns of Evidence. Yes. So, so with that definition as a background, I'm going to share some scriptures with you that, that speaks, that doesn't mention the word science, but that speaks of our world and of nature and of the natural life that we live. But with all these definitions of, of science, one of the biggest questions that come up in discussions among people of faith, especially people of the Christian faith, and scientists is how old the world is carbon dating. Okay, so let's look at carbon dating through the lens of the definition I just gave you of what science is. Now there have been tests and experiments and things of that nature, but it was men who came up and corroborated their own method of how carbon dating was to be done. Now I'm not going to stand up here and try to pretend to be an expert and tell you how old the world is. All I know is that in the beginning the earth was without form and void. There was something here. It just wasn't formed like it is now. And I got to tell you, it doesn't matter to me how old the world is when it comes to my faith. Uh, so those arguments aren't even pertinent to me. But what I will say, and probably what this show is trying to show, is that the Bible and science... Science actually helps prove the Bible. Science actually helps prove what has happened and what is told in the narrative of Scripture. And so if we're going to capture a biblical worldview of it, we need to look at a couple of Scriptures that say this. Psalm chapter 111 and verse 2 
says the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. So that means every scientist, whether they know it or not, are studying the works of the Lord. Whatever they're looking at, whatever they date, whatever they find, whatever they theorize is all based of something that is a work of the Lord. Because if you're having a biblical worldview and you believe that the Bible is 100% true and inerrant, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. And everything that we walk on and experience was created by God. And so those who study them, which are called scientists, are studying the works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Then in Job chapter number 38, and I know you've got to be thinking, Job chapter 38? Did I give you Job? Okay, let's start in verse 1 then. No, let's start in verse uh, 4, Job 4, Job 38, 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Now God is being really, God has the gift of sarcasm when he needs to, right? <laughs> this is corrective sarcasm from God and he's looking, surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted, and all the sons of God shouted. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from, its, from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling, swaddling band? When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors when I said this far you may come but no further and here your proud waves must stop have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it oh God is just pouring it out he is pouring it out it takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment from the wicked their light is withheld and the up upraised arm is broken. Not, he wasn't talking about your arm. <laughs> we go pray for your arm before we go tonight. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place that you may take it to its territory that you may know the path to its home. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow or have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the cluster of the, thank you, Pleiades, or loose the belt of Orion? Now we're talking about the study of the stars. Do you know the ordinance of heaven? Can you set their dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can pour out the bottles of heaven when the dust hardens in clumps and the clouds cling together? Oh, he is a mighty, awesome and creator God. Hallelujah. And he is declaring right there in his sarcastic reprimand in the book of Job that it is he who has created it. And as hard as we try to study it, we'll never be able to uncover all of it. The beauty of his creation. What's the biblical world of science? Worldview of science. It is an important aspect of man on earth trying to discover what God in heaven has created and done and will do. That's what it is. 
That's what it is. So there is no contradiction between science and the Bible. Science is just trying their best to prove all the things that God just asked them a question if they were involved in any of that. Who can know that except for God? There's one more verse in Job, I believe, that I want to share with you. Uh, let's see. Nope. Yeah, Job 26, 7. Well, actually, I got a lot of verses before that, don't I? Yeah, let me, let me hit some of those. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 12, says this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance? Colossians 1, verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and him all things consist. How many things are outside of all? There, there are no things outside of all things. So all things, uh, he was before them and he in him all things consist. Let me get a couple more really quickly. Psalm 104 verse 5. He set the earth, oh, you who laid the foundations of the earth so that should not be moved forever. Romans 1.20 for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's a whole message inside that passage of scripture right there. And then the last one is Job chapter 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over empty space and he hangs the earth on nothing. Wow, <laughs> that is the God of creation. He hangs the earth on nothing. When astronauts go into space and they uh, sail around the earth, they don't come across any ropes that have it attached to anything holding it in place. He hangs the world on absolutely nothing. And we will study until Jesus comes back until the new heavens and new earth are revealed and we will never know what we desire to know and what we pursue to know. But there is nothing wrong with the pursuit as long as we line it up with Scripture. Yes, sir. How about that? That is, that is Creator God. And science can try to figure out all of that and it's great trying to get to that place, but I can just hear God in heaven when they think they've come up with some radical theory that explains things. Oh, were you there? <laughs> when I started that whole thing. <laughs> were you there when I took my finger and ran it down the Grand Canyon and made that big canyon? When I outlined, all of, when I flung the stars into space and named them in the same breath? No, that, that's creator God. And so there is no contradiction between, the world tries to make a contradiction between science and God, but there really is none. It's the pursuit of trying to know all these things that God has created for us. And so that's our biblical worldview. Anybody? Uh, yes, ma'am. It's just interesting to me. I think one of the main theories that you know, Christians don't believe that gets taught in school is um, Darwin's theory mm -hmm. of evolution. And it's interesting, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to listen to apologists talk, uh, but it, it's just so interesting. And, and I mean, they will get so elaborate in their explanation of this theory, but then at the end of the day, but who created these things that you're saying, you know, became all of this? And, you know, there's just nothing that they can say. I want you to do something. There is a leap of faith at some point because. I want you to share. Will you share it? The peanut butter and jelly. This is really good. This is how she explained it to our children. Um, this is how I explained intelligent design. And I bet every mother in this room has a way that they did this with their children. But I would tell my children it was peanut butter and jelly theology. This was how I explained intelligent design. And I would tell them, now if there was a plate with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on it, on that counter, 
And I tried to tell you that that peanut butter and jelly sandwich got there by itself and nobody put it there. I said, you would not believe me because you know, even as a child, you know that peanuts grow somewhere. Somebody grew the peanuts, somebody made the peanut butter and grapes grew, somebody harvested the grapes, somebody made that grape in, that, those grapes into jelly and then at some point somebody put that on uh, bread that was baked and put it on there and then ha had a plate and put it on the plate. And you know, when you think about that and then you compare that to what they are asking us to believe, mm -hmm. that this world in the end, the, just the intricacy. intricacy of it got here by itself, that is a way bigger leap of faith. Way and bigger. there's another, and there's a, um, there was a, a famous scientist that was a, um, an atheist, and I want to tell that too. And I don't know what the dates are, but I'm sure everybody's probably seen it, where it says Nietzsche was the famous scientist, and he said, God is dead. And then had, um, it had the date where Nietzsche said, God is dead. And then what they made was then they put another little quote underneath, and then it says, oh, it says, God is dead, Nietzsche. You know, like that's his yeah. quote. And then right underneath, sometimes you'll see Nietzsche is dead. God. God. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy for us to prove Nietzsche is dead. There's no way they could ever prove that God is because he's alive. Yeah. Amen. And when the, the, the whole aspect of intelligent design, Tammy and I went to the Gulf Breeze Zoo on Monday. And uh, it was a beautiful day to go to the zoo. And we went to the, to the zoo and you're just looking at the animals there and we came to the zebras and of course they have the little plaques there that you read about them and it says just like a thumbprint no stripe pattern on any zebra is like any other zebra and people want me to believe that that just happened that that just randomly happened the big bang theory that there was this big cosmic bang you know what that bang was when god spoke bang it happened yeah when god spoke that was the that was the big bang that everybody is talking about because god spoke this world into existence anybody else comments questions anything about science and biblical worldview i, I tell you what i just about caught the holy ghost up here just talking about <laughs> How awesome and powerful and wonderful a God is. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say I just about caught the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah, who, who are we? Woo! Glory. Mm. Yes, he does. Yeah. That he hung it on nothing. Yeah. That's all the, that's the revelation that can only come from God. Amen. I love it. Woo. Now I'm going to move to another subject that it may not be quite as exciting. <laughs> uh, but one that was brought up that uh, we want to talk about just a little bit. And that is uh, the biblical worldview of global warming. Speaking of science. Now first, before we get into the, just I got three scriptures I want to share on global warming. Maybe five scriptures on global warming. Uh, but before I get there, I, I just want to say this for me personally. Uh, Tammy and I, and if any of you have ever been to Alaska or the poles where there are glaciers, where you can still see glaciers that are... Uh, stories thick, not feet thick, but literally stories thick that are leftover glaciers from from when? From the Ice Age, which was a long time ago. And when you see that and then you hear that man is responsible for destroying the earth. Now, please understand, are there things that we can be smarter about? Yes. Absolutely there are. 
But the reality of life, well, let me just share a couple of scriptures with you about what kind of addresses global warming. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22 says this, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So I read a little bit about global warming and the temperature has increased over the last 100 years by point zero four degrees. Now, I know scientifically that's probably significant because in order for us to live on this planet, there are certain temperatures that need to be maintained. So I'm not discounting that it may be getting warmer, but it's not because of, it's not solely because or even predominantly because of greenhouse gases, which is what is generally purported to be the reason for this global warming. And if we don't stop cutting down trees and we don't stop driving our cars, one day the earth is going to melt away. Can I tell you something? According to scripture, this place is going to be here till Jesus comes back. Now, when Jesus comes back and the thousand year reigns over, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that comes. But until then, this place is staying here. And we ain't all going to melt or burn up until that great last battle and we ain't going to be the ones that burn up. It's going to be those that have rejected God. He said, while the earth remains, so until he comes back, yes, the glaciers are melting because it gets warm in the summer and cold in the winter. And those processes are natural processes. Now, again, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, that's Genesis 8, 22. Here's the next one. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23. For the earnest, now this is going to be talking about creation here. and We've already established when we were talking earlier and just about got excited enough to run around the church. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So that means this creation, when man fell, creation became corrupted. It's in bondage of corruption. So there's things that are decaying, things that are slowly ebbing away. And can I tell you, they're going to be ebbing away in perfect time for Jesus to return and for the new heavens and the new earth to come. And to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole earth the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The biblical worldview of glo global warming, if you're going to have discussions about it, go back to the parts of the verse that talk about there's going to be heat and cold, there's going to be sea time and harvest, there's going to be light and dark, that is going to be part of the natural progress of things. So as we establish that, when we have those conversations, and by the way, remember, they're not debates, they're conversations. Debates are left for the professionals to get on TV and sit in chairs and fascinate us. <laughs> because I get fascinated when guys like Ravi Zacharias, how many of you are familiar at all with Ravi Zacharias? I'm going to tell you, I want to go and ask a question just to see if I can stump the man. He has this incredible, it's a gift, I believe it's an anointing from heaven as a Christian apologist and a Christian defender of the faith in all aspects of science and everything else. So we don't need to be debaters. We need to be uh, able to defend or to have a worldview that explains to folks what we think about global warming. And by the way, none of these should become political issues for us. They should become biblical issues for us. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Not what this guy says or this guy says. It's what the Bible says. Psalm chapter 46, verses 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, through its waters, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah. We will not be afraid. Global warming is not going to be the downfall of mankind. It's another distraction 
that the enemy uses for what the real downfall of mankind is. And it's a simple three letter word. Sin. Sin is what's going to bring us to the end of the age. Sin, unrepentant sin, unregenerated sin is what's going to bring us. It's not going to be all of the glaciers melting. It's going to be sin. Yes, ma'am. think about the fossil fuels that they say are causing this. In my mind, being a layman, I think, you know, to say that all of this is significant in the demise of the earth would be to say that God put all this oil in the ground that he didn't know that we were going to use it yeah. to make fuel. And so, um, you know, I mean, so you, you just have to believe that that whatever happens, you know, God is in control. The Bible tells us that the earth will one day wax old like the garment. Yeah. And um, and that the end will come. And mm -hmm. I think that fact is so frightening to people that push God away and don't want to believe in God. They want to believe anything other than the fact that this is not forever. And one day the world will come to an end. God will judge mankind. I think part of, you know, a godless community desiring to believe these things, because it, it's funny because they, they teach one thing out of one side of their mouth, and then they teach global warming. They teach us that there's been ice ages, and then it melts. And there's been ice ages, and it melts. And then they say, you know, and then they try to get us all concerned and raising money for this global warming, and I don't know. Yeah, and funny how when the other ice ages melted, there were no cars around then to put exhaust into the ozone. They just kind of melted on their own some kind of way. I read an article very similar to what you were talking about that, that talks about it in that very same way that all of these things that we discover that are in the ground that have been a result of ice, ice ages that, and then the melting and then uh, all of these things were part of God's provision for the people of the earth and yes we still abuse provision but it's part of God's provision for the people of the earth so before we leave global warming I want to just mention should we be good stewards of the earth absolutely uh, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 the Bible says this then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth. So the earth is our responsibility. And so we do need to be good stewards over the earth, but we don't need to let our focus be and our, our champion argument be that we need to be so caught up in protecting the earth because it goes back to what Tammy was saying. The reason why man wants to have reasons that the earth is coming to an end is so they don't have to admit it's coming to the end because God says it's coming to an end. And if it's, and, and if it's something that they can change to make the world last longer, then they can deny the whole thing of sin. That sin is the reason the earth will come to an end. So if we can create something that if we can change this, we can preserve the earth forever and many more years, they can still live in denial of the fact that God has already set in motion what's going to bring about the end of the age. And the only way they can delay that for themselves is through repentance of sin and turning their life over to God. It's amazing how all these things point to salvation. And provide salvation for men. One more scripture on global warming and being a good steward is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Genesis, is it 2? Genesis 2, 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So yes, we need to be good stewards over what God has placed into our hands. We need to be wise in the things that we do. But we don't need to be consumed with the fact that if we do these, we're going to be able to preserve the earth longer. No, we're good stewards because God has placed us here and he gave us an instruction to have dominion over it, subdue it, and to tend it. This is the day of the Lord that, you know, God is the one that 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so if Jesus don't know, and the only one that knows is God the Father, we certainly don't know, and there's no way that we can extend it out through global warming. Any, any other comments? Any questions? Any anything on global warming? Not as big an issue now as it used to be, but it's still out there, and we still get it hit with it all the time. By the way, they've kind of changed the name from global warming to climate change. So, you know, they, they already feel like they were beginning to lose their argument about global warming, so they've changed the nomenclature a little bit to climate change because that explains a little better that minute increase in temperature over the last hundred years. All right, it is 8.03, so I'm gonna hit this one really quick. I think. Did you notice all the NLTs I had written t next to the... Thank you very much. Terry, you're awesome. I'm going to talk about biblical discipline. <laughs> My wife, God bless her heart, substituted in a high school this week. Now, Miss Terry, do you teach in high school, elementary school, inner city elementary? I love that. We need to have conversations about that. Now, I got to tell you, God gifts people for certain things. And I believe anyone who teaches high school, whether they're a believer or not, it's a gift from God. I believe it's a sovereign move of God for anybody to teach high schoolers in the day and age in which we live. Because of this very subject we're about to talk about right now. So when I went to pick her up, she got in the car and she had sent me a little text that I didn't quite understand what it meant. But then when I reread it, I went, oh no. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell what it was, but I went, oh no. So when she got in the car, I said, well, because I talked to her and the first half of the day was a really good half of the day. She was teaching English as a second language and most of the students in there really want to learn English. So they, you know. But the second half of the day, not so much. And the disrespect, now we all know that substitutes get no respect. They're Rodney Dangerfield of the teacher world. Substitute, but no teachers get respect, Period. I could tell that just by riding by the high school that day. The things, and, and, and I know it was a gift of God because my wife got in the car and I, I knew she was tired because, you know, you teach class any length of time and you're going to be tired when you come out. But I knew she was tired, but she got in the car and her spirits were just so good. And, and I said, well, how was it? And she said, oh, my God, it was the most horrible afternoon <laughs> but her spirit was just so up and then she began to tell me some of the things that these kids said to her and I wanted to turn the car around and go back down to the high school with a board in my hand and I ain't even playing I wanted to go down there and just take some action and she was laughing and then she said this has got to be the Holy Ghost because the it was just the most horrible teaching experience I have ever had. And we began to talk about it, and then we got a little more uh, in-depth to it, and we both began to talk about how, how sad we feel for, number one, the teachers that are there every day. Number two, the students that want to learn that can't because of the behavior of the other students. But then number three, for the bad students themselves. Because most of the time, and it could, and, and I know that there are extenuating circumstances and they may have come from single parent uh, families through no choices of their own. They may have been abandoned by uh, all kinds of things that could have happened. But I would venture to say the vast majority or certainly the majority of the children in there get no Discipline at home. And certainly no biblical discipline at home. I, can I do justice to this in eight minutes? 
Pastor John, are we going to have to do two Wednesdays on discipline? So let me just start with some scriptures here. Um, first scripture, Proverbs 13, verse 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. This is the biblical worldview of discipline. Now, I know in our culture today, spanking is taboo. It's no-no. It's all of that. I don't know how any of you, I've never asked any single one of you how you feel about spanking. You have not asked me, but I'll tell you today, if I had kids at home, I'd still be spanking. Amen. That's just me. That's just me. Okay. But there is even a proper way to biblically discipline a child. Now, if you read the King James or the New King James, they don't, they don't pull no punches in there because they use the word beating your child. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. And sadly, and I'm sure, Ms. Terry, you see this in elementary school age children, not just high school age children, kindergartners that have no discipline at home. Now, the world has told us, and can I tell you, it's an anti-biblical statement. The world has told us that spanking is wrong and it should never be done. Huh? Yeah, let the police do it. Let the police handle the discipline of your children. Yeah. So discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, who will ruin their lives? Parents. This is, this is to the core of personal responsibility. That there have been two generations now that have been taught, and not just about discipline, but about everything, that they're... Anything that's wrong with you or anything you fail to do is not your fault. It is somebody else's fault. And the world used that to tell children who were spanked when they were young that it was because of the spankings they received that they have turned out the way they have. I got to tell you, it is because of the spankings I've received that I've turned out the way I've turned out. And when... when there was discussion about putting the fear of God in somebody in terms of discipline at home. I know what that meant. That meant a rod or something was coming. Now, we are not to beat our children. We're not to discipline them in anger. We are supposed to do this to help turn them from whatever that behavior was. We're not just to use our frustration just to mete out punishment. But I got to admit, not proud of it. But as a father, there were times that it would go that way. You feel horrible when that happens. You're tired, you're frustrated. You do those kind of things. But the world tried to use those rare instances to change the biblical model of discipline in the home. Let's look at a few more. And I'll do these, these next few in the next five minutes, so we'll be out by 8.15. Proverbs, where'd I go? Where was I at there? 22.15. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far away. Now, there are some things a timeout may fix. And then there's some things that nothing but physical discipline is going to fix and going to help change and mold and shape them. Proverbs 23.13 and 14. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. This is not going to kill you. The way they scream, they try to make you think you're killing them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. And can I tell you this? As I look back over my life, I didn't see it then. I didn't see it five years after then. But I can look back now and see where the physical discipline my daddy gave me probably did spare me from death from allowing me to put myself in situations that were going to get me hurt badly. Let's look at a couple more. Oh, let's look at the message in that one. Did I? Do we have? Don't be afraid to correct your young ones. A spanking won't kill them. I like the message sometimes. It just like puts it out there. A good spanking, in fact, might save them from something worse than death. 
Excellent words from the message. Proverbs 29, 15. To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. 29, 17, just two verses down, says this. Proverbs 29, 17. Okay, sorry, that was my fault. Yeah. And will make your heart glad. Now, it's long range. They're not going to make your heart glad right after you discipline them most times. Unless you sit down and explain what you've done and why you've done it. Last one, Ephesians 6, 4. Was that on there? And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Discipline begins at home. Now, in situations where it doesn't, and, and I can tell you, when I was in junior high and middle school, I had a favorite principal. His name was Mr. Steele. S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. I will never forget the man. He walked down the hall with a three-foot paddle in his back pocket. And when I left junior high school and went to high school, I got, he gave me his three-foot paddle as a graduation present. Not because he never used it on me, but because I was the most prolific paddled person in the eighth grade. I don't say that with any great pride. I'm just saying. But I want you to know I never forgot Mr. Steele. And when he came to me when I graduated and gave me that and he laughed a little bit, he put his arm around me, he told me he loved me and he said, man, you're going to grow up to be something. All, all the pain from those licks that I got the three years I was in middle school just totally left me because he had disciplined me in such a way that while still in high school, I still was a bit of a character. I didn't win no paddles in high school, though. But today, that ain't happening in school. I I'm assuming in Escambia County, there's no corporal punishment ever allowed. Huh? Only if it's approved by a parent. And God bless the parents that will approve that because they trust the teachers or the administration enough to do that. But we need to know and understand that the worldview of corporal punishment or uh, physical discipline is not a biblical worldview. Now, I'm not telling all of you that don't feel strongly about it, that you need to go home and start whipping your children. Um, but what I am telling you is that it is okay scripturally. In fact, it's the instructions of scripture that if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. And that second scripture we read said that it's not going to be them that leads them into trouble. It's going to be you that leads them into trouble for lack of discipline. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir in here because I can see on your faces you're a bunch of spankers. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> But we need to understand what the Bible says. We don't spank because we were spanked when we were young. I, don't, I didn't spank my kids because, or I should have never spanked my kids because my daddy spanked me. We should understand why we do it is because the Bible says this is how God set this thing up to be. And they should be few and far between. If they're done correctly, they will be. They will be because they'll bring about the desired result. So anybody comments or questions on biblical worldview before we go? Yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We have to teach and train our children. 
in the correct way and discipline them according to Scripture. And I'm just telling you the biblical worldview of corporal punishment is it's not mandated by Scripture, but it is certainly promoted by Scripture and encouraged by Scripture to help us raise and train up our children in the way that they should go. Consistency. Well, I think you've been welcome to the sisterhood of motherhood right there. Yeah. I agree. Uh, what we see in the schools is a product of the homes, uh, for sure. And so we do have to be consistent in all that we do. What I love is when I talk to kids that are about to get married and they said, oh, no, we'll never spank our children. And then I see them two years later after they have a two-year-old. They've totally changed that view. Three, four, five, six, and as they get older. And when they got a 10-year-old, oh, my gosh, if they've tried to make it through two to 10, when they get to 10, they've radically changed their mind. And I loved it when our kids came back to us after they had kids and said, please forgive us for everything we ever did. <laughs> I said, you do reap what you sow, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this night that you've given us. God, that you uh, teach us from your word and help us to understand why, what we need to believe and why we need to believe it. Not just the what, but the why and the where that it comes from. So God, I pray that you would uh, make this a part of who we are, and we will continue to uh, establish this biblical worldview of everything that is around us. And God, I pray for Sylvia tonight, Lord. I pray that you would touch her arm, God, and bring healing to that thing. God, her elbow and these tendons and everything that have been uh, torn, I, I pray, God, that you would use whatever means necessary to bring health and healing to her arm, reliever of this pain, Father, in the name of Jesus. For all of our church family that's here and that are not here with us tonight that are hurting, God, I pray that you would take your healing hand and place it upon their body and let them feel and sense the presence and power of God flowing through their bodies, bringing health and healing in Jesus' name. Now, God, bring us back together. Go with our women this week, uh, weekend, Lord, as they go to the women's retreat. Bring them back, Lord, full of the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Uh, keep them safe going and coming. No car trouble, no anything, God. Everything just goes smoothly while they're there. Let them be a blessing to the other women while your spirit is a blessing to them. We give you thanks for that. Bring us back together on Sunday to celebrate your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight.